Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. We're a little bit behind the schedule, so my job is tighten it up and bring it back on the schedule, so I will do that. Everyone will have 10 minutes, and then we'll have 15 minutes for Q&A. So the topic of the, uh, of the panel is international organizations and population well-being. The question that we would like to discuss is the role of international organizations in helping people's well-being. Um, and um, it's clear that over the years, the role of the international organizations has evolved dramatically, and the approaches have become much more complex and comprehensive. Um, whether those approaches work or not, and what are the best practices, and where we have successes, and where we would like to perhaps uh, do better, that's something we would like to our panelists to touch upon. And uh, we wanted it to be not quite just uh, your regular uh, everything is smooth thing, but there are failures too. Things like coordination perhaps, uh, the efficiency of use of resources, something like that, and see whether we can improve. Because, you know, five years from now we will be sitting in the same room and we'll be discussing how things have evolved over the last five years, but it's better to, to force that evolution now. Thank you very much. With this we'll start with Sergey Guriev. Thank you. Thank you very much, Timofey. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to speak here as a Former colleague of yours, Director of New Economics School in Moscow, I highly appreciate what Kiev School of Economics is doing in training new generation of economists for Ukraine and uh, also in uh, participating in the policy dialogue. I think this is actually something that many people outside of our countries take for granted, that you have local economics profession that you can engage, you can work together with, but these economics uh, uh, institutions don't emerge out of thin air. Somebody has to work on them and build them, and I'm, I'm very happy that conferences like this attract a lot of people. So let me talk about international organizations and, and well-being. Uh, Timofey said there have been problems, there will be problems, but we believe we just updated our way of looking at population well-being, so probably uh, our failures are behind us. Absolutely. So, uh, so basically, uh, to be serious, I think now in the West, many people have, woke, uh, have, have faced uh, something that our countries have faced before, that if you only look at macro numbers, if you look at average numbers, GDP statistics, uh, debt to GDP ratios, that doesn't tell you the whole story. And if you have large parts of populations left behind in terms of access to public goods, in terms of access to economic opportunity, access to careers, you may actually end up with a situation where these people vote against reforms. And in some cases, you can actually have populist politicians coming to take over, and in some cases, that's not going to be the case in the West, but in some of our countries, those populist politicians also remove political checks and balances, and then you cannot vote them out of office. So these things are very, very important, and our organizations, at least speaking for our organization, IBRD, have learned this lesson, and we uh, thought about these issues hard, and November last year, we updated what we call transition concept. We still talk in the language of transition, and being here in Ukraine, I'm very happy because this country is still a country of transition, so here this Eternal word resonates. Transition. Yeah, we are, I, I should say we, we are based in the UK, there, there is also transition, which means transition from EU to non-EU, but it's not something that we do. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what we did uh, last year, uh, we thought that uh, we need to build sustainable market economy, and meaning sustainable being not just econo environmentally sustainable, which is also a very important uh, part of what we do, but also politically sustainable, socially sustainable, socially just. So when people see what we do, they understand how we contribute to well-being. It's not just an empty word. We are a bureaucratic organization. We cannot just come out and say, we want to maximize well-being, and then we go back and do business as usual. We have certain rules, and what we just did a year ago, we updated those rules. So we now have six dimensions of uh, uh, transition concept, which we call transition qualities, qualities of a sustainable market economy. And the first one is still competitiveness. We still believe, as 25 years ago, that market economy is good, private entrepreneurship is good, and uh, this is a great alternative to state ownership and uh, command economy. But that, this is just one dimension. And we accompany this with uh, inclusion and good governance. Why do we do that? Why do we think that inclusion is important? Exactly because people should not be 
people left behind. And again, we don't believe in full equality. We, we are walking away from socialism, but we believe in equality of opportunity. So people should have access to opportunities, disregard what, whatever the parental uh, background is, their ethnicity, race, and gender. And we actually uh, invest in projects that can open up opportunities for people who otherwise would be denied uh, careers or access to markets and so on. So governance is also very important. Uh, we uh, invest in projects that promote good governance at the country level, subnational level, but also co company level. And uh, I'll, I'll give some examples later, but basically this is to make sure that when people see the outcomes of those projects, they understand that economy is becoming fairer. The distribution of uh, fruits of the reforms is just. In the previous panel, we talked about socially just pension system. This is actually not an empty word. This is something that m uh, matters a lot for voters when they decide what to do and how, how to vote and whom to support. In some cases, you see that a welfare of people is growing and they still don't believe it's a just system and vote against the system. We also, uh, we also have three other dimensions, one of them being green. We, are, uh, we have a target of uh, having 40% of our investment being green. And this also has a justice, social justice system, an inclusion, uh, uh, social justice dimension, an inclusion dimension. Why? Because we want to be fair to the future generations who still cannot vote. And uh, we want to make sure that uh, our, our planet is, is as sustainable as uh, it was or, or uh, was supposed to be when we, we started to work. And then we also have a goal of resilience and we also have a, uh, when financial systems survive external shocks and uh, energy security is there, food security is there, so external shocks don't wipe out uh, socioeconomic equilibrium. And the final thing is integration, when we think that market economies should uh, have integration both cross-border and, and uh, within, within the country. So this is what we do, and along of each of those dimensions, we measure how each potential project can contribute to make the economy more inclusive or better governed and so on. And then uh, bankers who look for those projects actually have special incentives to look for those projects, to implement those projects, to deliver on those projects. And economists actually uh, rank those projects and say, for this project, uh, you only get 60, and for that project, you get uh, 70. And of course, uh, bankers, being uh, people who care about incentives, uh, move into the direction of more inclusive and, and uh, better governed projects. And here in Ukraine, we do that too. Uh, we are very proud that uh, we are uh, working with Nafta Gas uh, and uh, with whatever um, uh, um, uh, 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 limits to the success or whatever uneven success we have observed over uh, previous years. Of course, Naftagas is a company which is very different from what it was, uh, used to be three years ago, in particular in, in terms of uh, corporate governance. We also work with small businesses and together with EU for Business, we uh, uh, open up 15 business support centers because, again, small businesses create jobs for people who otherwise may actually uh, not uh, able to, to find jobs. We also uh, invest in municipal transfer because this in Ukraine is actually a very important uh, part of well-being. Uh, access to jobs within cities, also for people who live uh, outside of city center. We've done that in uh, Lviv, we've done that in Kharkiv. And uh, in each particular project, it's no longer enough to say we are going to make money and we are going to make the economy more of a market-based economy. We want to make sure that economy works for the people. And that's, uh, that's we, what we actually do now every, every time. And that, uh, that is, I think, uh, Make, is making our bankers who talk to clients uh, uh, more proud of what we do. Because they, they say, we are here not just uh, to have a check uh, on the list of reforms or list of projects, we are actually here to deliver better uh, society and better country for people. Uh, we uh, are making a system which is more transparent, more accountable, and delivers, uh, delivers fruits of growth to everybody. Now, whether it works in practice or not, uh, this is something that, of course, is a 
probably to discuss in Q&A. Uh, but uh, overall, I think this is, this is, uh, this is our intention. And uh, as a chief economist, I'm actually responsible for this. So I'll be very happy to talk about, about those issues in Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's give um, Sergey a round of applause. And uh, we move right away to Claudia Maximenko, World Bank. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, to make a long story a little bit shorter, you know, like in, in toasting, you say a la verde, which means I basically accept or I support everything that was said by the previous speaker because it's, <laughs> as to the International Development Bank, it applies to IBRD the same way it applies to EBRD. We do work in the same areas. We do look, we do um, seek the investments and the economy to be more people oriented and so on and so forth. I hope you remember what was, uh, what was said. Um, in terms of uh, successes, uh, if you travel around Ukraine, you, you must see um, some infrastructural improvements which bear the, the, the plate say, saying supported um, by the investments from the European Development Bank or from International Development Bank. So um, you, you must see some investments or some results of the infrastructural investments. There are also some investments which are less visible into so, sort of soft areas like governance, like public finance management, like improvement of um, state treasury, or like in improvement of governance of power distribution system. You don't see it as um, everyday users, but um, Given the fact that those systems still work, should hint you that something was done on them after um, the transition has started. Um, and I will then focus more on, on the failures, which I think are also pretty much common. And the failures are, for example, that as of today, International Bank for Reconstruction and Development has about two billion of its investments already allocated to Ukraine and the sitting undisbursed, which means that something is fundamentally wrong in terms of how the government and how the country decides on investments to be, uh, like on the loans to be taken and what to invest, and then decides on how to use those investments and how to manage them. Um, another failure, I believe, that uh, we still um, do not really ensure the, the, the cascading of the investments in a sense that uh, we come, uh, international development banks come and then generate further private investments. And this is something we started to really work together on. In terms of coordination, of course, all these international agreements on donor coordination are in place and we try to, um, to work in accordance with them. But uh, the, like, the practice shows that we are much better in coordinating for policy dialogue, for uh, pushing big ticket items with the government. It, go, it like, declines uh, exponentially. Um, as it goes for some practical issues, for some, um, I mean, for some um, smaller investments, for some community initiatives. This is, again, something to work on, but there I would also like to pass the responsibility a little bit towards the government. As uh, Timothy said, that five years from now we might sit here and discuss the same thing. No, 20 years from now we might sit, because 20 years ago we were sitting and discussing how best to coordinate donors and if the donors are left to coordinate themselves this is the mission impossible the government has to have a strategy and has to tell the donors where it sees the investments and assistance coming until the government takes the driver's seat and understands where it actually wants to drive this country to donor coordination is going to be um, like to have very uh, unsustainable and temporary success, which will depend on individuals, on individual strategies, on political preferences, and different things which are pretty volatile. Um, so here is uh, something to actually sit, uh, continue sitting with the government and discussing, but it has to do with the national idea, with the national strategy, and with finally understanding where 
are we going to as a country? And one of the directions hopefully would be to, if not joining EU, but at least adopting European values and becoming a partner and developing towards the European level of governance uh, and policies and with like how <laughs> how we are moving towards that, I'm sure Bernd knows much better. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, yes. the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And Bernd the Good, please. Yes, thank you very much, and I think uh, Claudia started already with uh, saying that uh, subscribing to what the previous speaker said, I think I can only uh, put that for both. I think much what was said is very much also what uh, I could uh, elaborate further on. And um, First of all, as Claudia was mentioning about EU integration, I think what keeps us going, and I think what is extremely important, is an association agreement. This country has expressed its aspiration of adopting, and what I would call, yeah, it's the European legislation, but it's a kind of what we are having in common ownership. I mean, it's the sort of, of ways of organizing our societies, the values in our societies, but also simply the transparency, everything what is in that society, we want to get it in here. Now, that process has started three years ago. Uh, it officially was uh, fully ratified on the 1st of September, so that's only two weeks ago. <laughs> um, where are we on that? I think it isn't, wherever you go to all the reform documents in the country, the last few years, it very much is referred to. However, if we look into where the processes are, it still is very much work in progress. And I think it can't be stressed enough. It is not that nothing has happened, but it can't be stressed enough to go back to it, to work on it. It's an awful uh, big job. If you, if you really go to the nitty gritty of it, the details of it, uh, preparing for a full-fledged EU integration is a very, very tedious job. And I think that's something which we are very much trying to work on, where we are working together with the country. And it inspires actually, I would say, the full range of the kind of cooperation what we were talking about before. This is, I, I found it very impressive to listen to uh, the speakers on the pension funds. I mean, much of that is in place. It's all there. But some way or the other way, it doesn't fully function. How do we get it back? How do we further enhance it? So it's very much revisiting uh, those aspects and working on it and trying to lift it uh, further. That's the first point I'd like to make uh, as my contribution here. The second one is, please be aware about the limited role of international donors. I think when it comes to the international financing institutions, they represent still a substantial proportion of uh, the contribution to what is in public spending. Uh, if you look into the donors that are coming with grant money, and I include ourselves uh, as one of the bigger ones in there, it's really a very small amount. We're talking about a couple of percent points to the uh, government's expenditure. And the moment the economy would grow, in all likelihood, these percent points are rapidly going down. It is, of course, money which enables to uh, pursue particular reforms and bring in an amount of flexibility, bring in an amount of extra ideas. And I often uh, refer to bringing in the elephant into the porcelain uh, cabinet because it's somebody from outside who can pose a couple of uh, critical questions. But be aware about how limited it is. And also, in that sense, um, yeah, give it the right uh, proportion. So. That's my second point. Now I would like to come back to the programs. And uh, as Claudia also referred to, she put it in the census, where are certain parts, I mean, what are our big challenges? I'd like to be a bit more positive. <laughs> I think the main thing, what we are having in between us, and also when we talk about an association agreement, I think the philosophy which we tried to develop over the last two years is, how can we facilitate that process of getting this modernization, this reform in the society going? And a lot of it bogs down about 
the reorganization of the way the government is working. I think that summarizes an awful lot. Here we are talking about, on one side, the decentralization, reforming the local governance structures, and doing things which were till now not done by those who are actually asked now to, do, to take up things. When you drive around the country, when you go and visit the newly established communities, etc., it's quite amazing to see how much new activities are going around that for quite a number of years were not done. Perhaps in the Soviet time they were done because it was established in a particular way. After the independence, because of the reshuffle in the control on the resources, quite a number of things did simply not happen. Disconnects were there. I mean, we can all discuss about how good uh, a Colgo system, etc., was, but the fact was that those Colgos very often were contributing to the local communities and made available quite a lot of money for those communities. I'm sorry, this afterwards, you got an agriculture system that does not do that because it does not contribute in, this, in the tax system. I'm not saying that we so good, should go back to that, uh, that system, <laughs> but it is important that we get those systems in order and that we are having uh, taxation systems that are connected to local economic development. The current decentralization process, dotted, we are in a big way supporting it across the country. The other side of that medal is the reorganization of the public administration. And I would say in its widest sense, that includes uh, the public finance management, that includes for me also actually the rule of law, that we get that system going and making it more effective. Of course, it, it is related to the decentralization because it's a lot of review of service delivery at central level, bringing it down to the local authorities. So that part, if I look into our program, is probably one of the major parts. And if we talk about what has been pretty much the topic of your day, of people matter, of delivery of social services, of delivery of education, of delivery of health, it needs a functional government system. And that, that's, I think, is the most important part. Coming to donor coordination. Um, we always tend to smile a little bit, or we always think this should be better, or something like that. I think it isn't too bad. But what is, of course, fundamental is that you're working in a government environment where a clear-cut vision is there, where a clear-cut strategy, a development strategy is there. I think we have made progress. I think the current uh, multi-annual uh, strategy which the government has put forward uh, forms uh, an hopeful anchor. Let's put it like that. I think we all need to work on it. But it's only based on such kind of uh, visions that you can get a proper donor coordination that you can talk concretely about, okay, you want to do that, but actually we should put more emphasis on this or that. Donors among themselves are not necessarily the easiest in their own coordination. I think on one side of, we're talking quite a lot among each other. I think we're doing quite well in many ways. But at the end of the day, we are also guided by institutional demands that are not under control of the country. There is London, there is Washington, and there is Brussels, <laughs> to mention a few. And uh, so we are somewhere in that continuous dilemma, but I think the willingness is very much there. What is most important is the leadership on the government side, in one way or the other way. And I think we're making progress, but we have to recall and, uh, every time and go back to that point. I think with those few remarks, I would like to uh, leave my contribution. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank you very much. Um, and, um, let's And Maria Alexinska, ILO. Yes, thank you very much. And indeed, on the program, you have uh, Sergei Savchuk, uh, the national coordinator of, uh, for Ukraine of the International Labour Organization. And unfortunately, he cannot be here today, so the organizers kindly suggested that I replace him. And I'm an economist also at the International Labour Organization um, in Geneva at the headquarters. So I would like just indeed to also say a few words about this organization. Uh, in case you don't know it, uh, International Labour Organization is um, uh, quite a unique and special or in organization because it is uh, one of the first international organizations, if not the first one that was uh, created. It was created in 1919, so almost 100 years ago, uh, at the end of the First World War with the signature of the Treaty of Versailles, uh, with the signature of the Peace Treaty. 
Um, and it was created at that uh, specific and unique moment in time because there was still the realization, a very strong one, that uh, one of the reasons uh, for the First World War to happen was um, very strong social injustice. So the war was over, the peace treaty was signed, but there was a still understanding that the social in injustice is still there and uh, it can uh, come back and, and indeed uh, it came back. Um, but uh, so the ILO was created with the motto that if you want to have peace in the world, you have to cultivate social justice. And this motto is still here today and it is uh, uh, as true as ever that if you want to have peace you, want, you have to cultivate social justice and this is how the organization has been operating ever since. So today the organization has uh, 189 uh, members around the world, um, um, country, uh, country members, and also what is unique about the organization is that it is a tripartite organization. It means that um, unlike uh, others where the members of the organizations are, are states, uh, at the ILO the members are the governments but also the representatives of workers and the representatives of the employers. So the organization serves as a platform for this very strong social dialogue. And one of the important things the organization promotes is the social dialogue uh, in order uh, to have peace and prosperity and, uh, and uh, and social justice in the world. So the organization had, had uh, of course, its long uh, history and ups and downs, and uh, there was a strong legacy and uh, uh, quite a different understanding of what it is during the times of the Soviet Union, of course, because uh, the trade unions were very strong and played a very special role, of course, in, uh, in a country like, uh, like Ukraine. Uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was a somewhat different view as to what the organization represents uh, especially in Ukraine, because of course, uh, uh, in, especially in the very few, first few years, uh, there was uh, quite a negative um, view uh, towards uh, trade unions um, uh, in the country that wanted to, to get rid of uh, the communist past. Uh, there was this uh, strong association of trade unions with communism and with everything that is regressive and, and of the past. And so, of course, it was uh, very hard um, uh, to work in this setting. And of course, it was also casting uh, a lot of doubts on the legitimacy of the whole ILO and, uh, and how it works. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, what the ILO works and what it does uh, has a, lo a lot of, uh, of course, implications uh, further and behind the only trade unions, precisely because it is tripartite. Uh, and today, uh, in Ukraine, um, we see that trade unions are reinventing themselves, right? Uh, they are, um, there is still and probably uh, much more than before the need for social dialogue, for dialogue at different levels. Um, our con uh, conference such as today is also the proof that the society needs dialogue, the society is open for dialogue, and once again that, uh, that gives a lot of uh, legitimacy uh, and role to the ILO. ILO is also um, very, uh, of course, famous for the role that it plays into the setting of international law. Um, unlike um, other organizations, it is not a donor organization, so its principal law is to create conventions and recommendations in the area that related to uh, the uh, labor uh, law, uh, to the labor markets, labor law, leg labor regulations, but everything also that is around that. So uh, issues of social protection, uh, issues of migration, etc. All of these are uh, pertinent to the uh, to the work of the ILO and the ILO over its uh, history created now uh, over uh, almost um, uh, 200 conventions and recommendations, which are um, voted for by the ILO Parliament, which once again con uh, is constituted of uh, members of this tripartite, uh, it has this tripartite structure, and then be it becomes the source of the international labor law. So the conventions are open up to ratifications, and for example, when a country like Ukraine ratifies an ILO convention, then it has to adjust its legislation or, uh, or include this into the legislation. So the ILO today in Ukraine work is, is here for the government 
to help it to ratify those conventions that are not ratified, for the ratified conventions to make sure that the laws are, um, are in line with those conventions. It provides technical assistance on uh, these uh, legal uh, ways of doing things. And of course, it is there to have a technical platform for many things, uh, for the improvement of the labor market, for improvement of social dialogue, and for improvement of social justice. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Maria. Thank you. And we'll open the floor for questions. Yes, please, Igor Shumil. Yeah, can we get the mic for Igor, please? This fine, there's translation. Uh, Igor, just a second, let's get the mic. Практически за исключением последнего выступающего, в трех первых ниш как по мне, совсем не шла речь о э, разбудове да, институционной испроможности недержавных организаций громадского суспильства. Вот видите ли вы перед собой задачу помощи в разбудове украинских независимых гражданских сообществ, НЖО, в создании именно ими и с помощью иностранных экспертов и специалистов ваших международных организаций своих аналитических продуктов качественных так, и умение создавать коалиции для доведения этих продуктов, проектов, законов до принятия решений. И второе. На самом деле, ну, мой опыт показывает достаточно, и вы об этом говорили, о большой работе и своих дискуссиях с правительством. Но видите ли вы необходимость изменения формата своих дискуссий и привлечения, опять же, институтов гражданского общества напрямую вот в этой трехсторонней дискуссиях по выработке качественной политики? Или вы считаете, что тот формат вашей работы с правительством устраивает, и он не требует прямого привлечения гражданских организаций и украинских НЖО? Спасибо. Сергей, Тогда я по-русски отвечу. So I'll probably answer in Russian. So thank you very much for the question. It's a really important question, and we are uh, very serious about the so-called third sector. Uh, this is the term we normally use to denote civil society. Well, <laughs> he answered in Russian, but uh, they asked him to produce the answer in Ukrainian. Um, it's fine? Okay. Okay. Uh, so, when people come from London to this country, we have a meeting with civil society organizations uh, and inside the bank we have a special unit responsible for the dialogue with civil society organizations and we always listen to their opinions and the projects we are implementing and that's very useful uh, and not to do harm to the welfare and well-being of people uh, just talking to the government only. So we um, are oriented towards the private sector and mainly we work in the regime you have mentioned. We work with in this format with business associations. And with the support of the EU, we work a lot here in Ukraine at the Office on Business Ombudsman with this office, while in other countries we are also doing the same. And for us, it is of crucial importance, and we definitely think that healthy civil society is a necessary component of a good system of uh, governance. Governance cannot do without a healthy civil society. And I think that for each country we have a, in, in its strategy annex number one, what kind of annex is it? 
This annex says that for every for each country's strategy, we make the assessment of the condition of the civil society governance or the quality of demographics by 14 items, whether the political rights are kept to, whether the human rights are kept to, and whether there is the freedom of expression, so on and so forth. Why do we do this? Because if everything, if, if not everything is all right with the civil society, so democratic inclusive institutes will work in a poor way. And that means that all the problems I have uh, mentioned can appear and the reform may not be done for the interests of the society, but for the interests of the so-called elite in inverted commas, which could be totally isolated from the society. Therefore, I do support your idea. I do agree with your opinion. And we are really doing our best to work in that way. We don't work with non-democratization issues, and we don't have the task of creating civil society in itself. But from the point of view of the work of uh, protection of rights of entrepreneurs, we work actively in this respect, in particular using our own resources and involving external donors' uh, resources, including the European Commission in Ukraine. Thank you. Sir, uh, there are mics over there. I just Do they work? They're functional? I think so. Thank you. Right. I think very much when we talk about all these kind of programs, it is implicit. I mean, we're talking about managing a society, uh, and that is not only the government in its formal setup, but it's very much also the other entities that are functioning in that society. And I think we are uh, pretty much a proof of the way how we have quite a diverse uh, support package that uh, civil society is involved. I think also here is very much a kind of encouragement of when you talk about things like decentralization, a lot of jobs, a lot of things what are done today by a government set up can actually be done by citizen initiatives. And that's a continuous encouragement. But also a matter of it's not about one central organization, but it's trying to get quite a diverse uh, body. And, um, if you, uh, I was yesterday in uh, Popasna on the contact line. You're in a small, a relatively small area. You're talking to uh, a group of citizens that are sitting together that is challenging in front of us the rayon administration on a number of things. I mean, that's the sort of activities that is necessary. Out of that, there could be more growing. I think we. What we see a lot when we talk civil society here, it's a lot about the central levels and about uh, the reform processes. I think it, it happens at all levels, and it is important that it happens at all levels. And yeah, I can only say we're very much uh, trying to stimulate it wherever possible, uh, but also it has to come from the society itself. Eh? It's not only a matter of because we as external uh, actors are there. When it is not there, of course, as again, I refer here back to the elephant, which is, can be very critical, which does unconventional things, goes through it, puts the questions, unpleasant, uncomfortable, gets it moving. But then at a certain moment, it has to come out of the society. And I think Thank it, you. It, it does come out of this society. Thank you very much. Um, we have three minutes. The way we're going to proceed, because we want to give voice to people, we'll collect three questions and we'll give uh, people to answer a number of them. Uh, so we have, please, go. Julia, Julia. Uh, just a second, I will give it to say, I, I'm in control of who gets to, uh, not, not Julia and not you. Okay, Do, thank you, yeah. go ahead, and then I'll give you uh, the floor in a second. Uh, Natalia Berezhna, uh, I'm from USAID, uh, um, that's an US agency on international development. Today we're not represented on a panel, but the questions asked today are very much to the point because civil society really needs to be on all the projects because the donor money is running out and we uh, have to think about about the sustainability of our projects, create a local expertise for the organizations that will go down the same pathway. So my question is as follows, how do you provide for the sustainability of donor assistance? This is an organization created in 1915 after the First World War. And I have another question. 
uh, from the point of view of uh, NGOs, civil society and the government. For example, uh, Ukraine is a member of and ratified different conventions and is a member of international treaties and has obligations to report under these conventions. For example, on convention on elimination of discrimination against women. And if we look, for example, at the state report on this CEDAW convention, we can see that a, a big part of this devoted to international organization programs. So government considers as it's their work and so they included into this report many uh, trainings, programs funded and also implemented by UNFPA, UN, UNDP and uh, other international organizations. But if we see the... So um, let me dialogue ask you, what's your question? We really question, have no yeah, time, okay. please. Uh, uh, the I'm going to shut down, it's at 18... Uh, at 45, 74, dialogue, no questions. So, okay, please. the dialogue between NGO, uh, NGOs and government is leading to the question that government doesn't consider themselves uh, that they are human rights defenders. So the question is, uh, what international organizations do, I think it's very important to remind the government that it, that it is not NGOs who has to be, that it is the government who has to remember that they, has to, they are human rights defenders and it, it, in accept, adoption, any a new regulation that has to uh, remember about Thank you, role. excellent question. Responsibility of the government. And one more question, please, uh, Yulia, on the, uh, in the middle, yes, please. Um, this gentleman in gray suit, please. Yes. Uh, dear donors, uh, could you be more imperative in your democratization efforts here? Uh, for example, as to the trade unions, uh, could you um, demand to use your money to defer the substances, to raise uh, special trade unions for students as to university, then to the professors separately, and then to the rectors and ministerial establishment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Three questions, 15 seconds each, please. Thank you. We'll start with Maria. Concluding the remarks. All right, excellent. So um, I was seconds, right please. to take a um, precaution and to say that ILO is probably uh, one of the first organizations uh, to be created. Uh, the ILO indeed has these conventions, and then uh, actually the big function of the ILO is then to ensure that the conventions are implemented. There is the whole review mechanisms, and governments and also social partners can make claims to the ILO and bring cases in front of the ILO tribunal, uh, so they are, um, they are looked at, examined, and then there are measures that can be taken. ILO is not a police, it's not an international like criminal tribunal, but it has a system of measures that can be taken to kind of have reprimands and to have uh, a constructive dialogue on how things can be changed. So there is this mechanism that, that is embedded in the function of the ILO. ILO is fully supported of uh, any creation of any uh, types of representations, whether it is trade unions, whether it is workers, whether it is employers, whether it's as any other part of the of the uh, uh, civil society, we're only fully for it. Uh, but it's also up to the local people uh, to to actually take actions and do it. We are a we are a platform to facilitate this dialogue. We're here for you, but it is up to you to create uh, those things to start. Thank with. you very much. Just on the question of sustainability and building of expertise, when it comes to doing public administration, again in its widest sense, what is important is that the capacity is substantially increased. What is one of the major problems is that there is quite a bit of capacity in this country, but those people are not sitting in those positions that have to deliver uh, that services. So an enormous emphasis on trying to stimulate renewal, bringing in new talent into the system, making the government uh, an attractive employer, and that's quite a challenge. Uh, but also what today on one side we see a lot in civil society organizations, but people are working actually in the more or less in the government and in functions that should be government functions. So how to, to bring that in? The money part is one, but basically to get the capacity and to get the national capacity going. And I think we put a lot of emphasis on it. And uh, just let's also be a little bit uh, self-promoting, um, but uh, together with EBRD, we are working here on the multi-donor account, which actually is, an, is a beautiful uh, instrument 
uh, quite original with putting a number of reform support teams across ministries uh, in place uh, and actually a whole reform uh, architecture uh, what is working today with the government and I think we will continue for that uh, for a while. Thank you. Thank you very much. Claudia. Um, yeah, in a sense of uh, sustainability, I believe that uh, one of the important things um, that ensures sustainability of our investments is that they are actually implemented by the government. Uh, and the assistance that we provide in, in course of that implementation is uh, a very significant uh, learning by doing effort. And uh, this basically leaves in the government people who have uh, had an experience of working with uh, international organizations of uh, are working on the basis of results frameworks, on uh, on the basis of um, management frameworks that are different from the government ones, and uh, this gives a kind of better outlook, better overview of what actually can be done in order to better manage the public investments that are uh, that the country is implementing. In terms of uh, engaging the the citizens and the um, non-governmental organizations. I would like to stress one thing. It has to be on a professional basis. What I see more and more happening because of like the effort to democratize as much as possible, we often engage organizations for the sake of engaging civil society organizations. Very often it is counterproductive. Civil society organizations, while being important and um, uh, while playing a significant role, especially volunteer organizations that play the crowdfunding role and basically saved the country. They are not free from, from political affiliation. They are not free. They are very often unclear in terms of their funding and they don't bear any responsibilities. So basically any organization doing something today may decide tomorrow stop doing this and switch its activity towards different direction. And it's, it's genuine right. And you cannot count on all the functions that are pertinent to the government or to other kind of sustainable bodies in the country to be transferred and to be implemented by the civil society organizations funded by international donors. That is what is unsustainable. Therefore, we try to, as much as possible, work with uh, educational institutions, universities, think tanks, which are more, um, uh, more stable in terms of what they do, what they're going to do five years from now, and what are their role in the society and obligations. That's an important thing to remember. While civic activity and civic engagement is very important, and it is as well as with, uh, in EBRD um, country strategy, we also have in our country strategy a plan on how we will engage citizens. We try to engage citizens directly by passing the um, necessary, so not making the organization's level necessary, A, and B, we are trying to engage with the civil society organizations on a professional basis by providing them opportunity to earn money and to work with us on the issues they can professionally work. Thank you Thank very you. much, Sergey. Yes, I, uh, let me say a few words about sustainability of money rather than sustainability of human capital. So we are not a donor. We are a bank. Some people think we are a donor, but we want our money back. And we do that. We actually make profits uh, on average. Um, and uh, that means that uh, we will continue investing in this country, in Ukraine, as long as we are, we are additional. So when we see that private sector doesn't need us anymore, we are no longer complementary in this economy. We will uh, quit. But uh, as long as there is a role for us, our mandate requires us to be here. So in our case, sustainability is almost automatic. As long as we can, we can promote a transition to market economy and good governance. Now, uh, that brings me to the question reminding government of its responsibility. Of course, we all remind the government that the government serves the people. But if all the governments were perfect, we would not be here. And uh, we don't operate in Switzerland or Sweden. 
right? Those governments don't need to remind them them that they serve the people. So we are usually in the countries where governments have imperfections. So that is unfortunately the problem. We keep reminding them, but again, we need civil society to uh, exert some other pressure and voters also vote for politicians that promise deliverable things and delivering those deliverables. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this concludes the panel. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause to the audience and to the speakers.